Hey guys, I just got finished watching the PlayStation 5 hardware reveal and I am amazed with just how much horsepower they can tuck into this little bitty console. But it got me thinking, this looks a lot like a modern computer. So we're gonna dig ourselves through the specs a little bit and we're gonna actually find some modern hardware that matches those specs and we're gonna build ourselves a PlayStation 5. We're gonna run it through its paces and we're gonna give you guys a sneak peek as to what kind of performance you're gonna get out of your shiny new PlayStation 5 come holiday 2020. Hey guys, Turk here. Hope you're having a great day. Man, the PlayStation has been a cornerstone to my living room ever since the early 2000s. You know, we've got a launch PlayStation 2 that we've done some modifications to on the channel. And I even camped out for a PlayStation 3, you know, a long, long time ago. And then it comes as no surprise that Sony has been a leader in terms of hardware performance and gameplay selection for the, its entire lifetime. Now we're sitting here at the dawn of the PlayStation 5. We've got the hardware specifications in our hand, and I wanted to give you guys some insight from a hardware developer perspective to kind of, you know, dig through these specs a little bit deeper. And this is probably why you're watching the video. We're gonna build this thing. We're gonna use current generation hardware, modify some of its functionality to match the console specifications, and we're gonna show you guys just how much horsepower and what kind of performance we should be getting from a bunch of the top AAA games out on the marketplace these days. So let's jump into the specs. In case you guys are new to the channel, I actually am a hardware development engineer, and I started my career off working on the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360. So I have background information when it comes to building a console, as well as optimizing and tweaking its interface for the best performance. And we've gotta keep three factors in mind when we're building the console today. That's power, performance, and price. With those factors in mind and our background information, let's dig our way through the PlayStation 5 spec. And to start us off, the CPU is probably the easiest one to talk about. The PlayStation 5 is going to have a Zen 2 based processor with eight cores boosting up to 3.5 gigahertz. And we don't exactly have that today on the market, but we have one that's pretty close. And that's gonna be our Ryzen 7 3700X. We picked this up for our 10700K review we did. You can check that up out at the top right. Uh, but it is also Zen 2 based with eight cores and 16 threads but it does boost up to 4.4 gigahertz and has a base clock of 3.6. So we're gonna have to underclock this one quite a bit and undervolt the snot out of it in order to meet the performance requirements as well as the power thresholds that will likely be imposed by the processor in the PlayStation 5. So probably the most overhyped piece of equipment in the PlayStation 5 is the storage solution. And they're finally catching up with the PC Master Race and going with a Gen 4 based NVMe drive that's rated to 825 gigabytes. It's likely a one terabyte drive with the extra storage partitioned off for you know extra usage. Uh, I don't have a Gen 4 NVMe of that capacity on hand. So we're just gonna be using a standard NVMe Gen 3 uh, storage drive for our operating system, and then a couple SATA drives to store our games. Uh, I can't test the claims that have been put out there in the marketing material, so we're gonna have to wait and see what the hardware developers and the game developers come up with in terms of innovation when it comes to storage. The next big budget item today is gonna to be memory, and the PlayStation 5 boasts an impressive 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 at 256 on the bit bus. And I can't just go to the store and buy GDDR6. There aren't motherboards that support that. So we had to make some compromises and I chose to go with a single stick of eight gigabytes of DDR4 3200 for the CPU. Zen 2 loves the faster data rates and I think it's a pretty decent compromise when it comes to performance against the two memory interfaces. And then our graphics card is gonna have six gigabytes of GDDR6 on board. So uh, you know, we're a little shy when we compare directly against the PlayStation 5, but I think it's a pretty decent analog to the games we have access to now, but obviously the PlayStation 5 will have a better performance having everything directly accessible with their architecture. All right, so let's talk about the big boy and that's the GPU. We've heard a lot about the RDNA 2 graphics card that's gonna be in this PlayStation 5 and we don't have a direct analog to it, but some of the specifications do lead some light. It's gonna have 36 compute units. It's gonna boost up to 2.23 gigahertz. And I think it's got about a 10 10.2 ter teraflop you know, performance metric. You know, I'm not too concerned. If y'all go and look at the product pages on the AMD graphics cards, they list like three different teraflop metrics. So I don't know which one they're referring to. So I'm not too concerned with that, 
but I'm more concerned about the compute units as well as the TDP. So currently there's two graphics cards that meet that criteria and that's the 5700 and the 5600 XT. Now, we all know about hardware shortages and I was only able to get my hands on the 5600 XT at my local big box store, but it only is about five to 8% slower than the 5700. And this card is at a 150 watt TDP to begin with. So we're gonna have to underclock and undervolt this to meet a you know realistic power budget for the graphics card when it's installed onto the console. But going into the RDNA 2 architecture, we haven't seen a lot of you know performance metrics other than that teraflops number. So the prime marketing material I'm gonna be comparing against is the 50% performance per watt improvement that is supposed to be coming with the RDNA 2. Now, I can't really verify that claim at all, but we can at least make some assumptions with some of the data we collect going into the future. So some of the deficiencies of this 5600 XT, which I don't think are too bad, but it does not have as wide of a bit bus. This one's gonna have a 192 bit bus for the memory, whereas PlayStation 5 is gonna have 256. And then of course the boost clock speed of this is not gonna be anywhere close to the PlayStation 5. We're gonna be at a game speed of right around 1650 megahertz and probably a boost of 1700. Uh, but since we're underclocking and undervolting, there's no way we're gonna be able to hit the PlayStation 5 spec, but I still think this is gonna be a really close analog. So with the major components out of the way, we only have room for the motherboard, the power supply, the case, and if you're gonna go with the disc edition, the UHD Blu-ray drive. You know, I'm, I'm not gonna worry about that part of the specification today. I'll factor some of that into the cost later in the video, but let's talk about power and performance because that's gonna be critical when explaining some of the data coming up. In order to make accurate performance predictions today, we do have to keep in mind the power envelope that we have. I think the launch PlayStation 3 came in at right around 210 watts to 230 watts, and even the PlayStation 4 Pro, it runs right around 140 to 160 watts. And as console gamers, we know that, you know, our consoles run hot, they run loud, and they burn lots of power. So it's gonna be really difficult taking these desktop components and merging them into our simulated PlayStation 5, but I think we've got it figured out. So the CPU is actually the easiest one to do today, and the desktop part is rated for 65 watts, and we, through underclocking and undervolting, we managed to get it to a TDP of right around 28 watts, which is over 50% performance improvement. So that's gonna go a long way in terms of total system power, but the hard one's gonna be the graphics card. This one's rated at the GPU for 150 watts, which already beats our thermal budget. So again, we're gonna be undervolting and underclocking our graphics card to hit a 100 watt threshold but the good news is we didn't have to downclock our frequency all that much in order to hit that envelope. So right now with the CPU and the GPU into consideration, we're sitting right at 130 watts, but we also have to take into account the motherboard, the memory, and all the other system components. And at idle, our gaming PC is running right at around 70 to 75 watts. So I'm not gonna take that out of the measurements we've done in the, in the rest of the video, but to keep it all into context, we're right around 200 to 210 watts at full gaming load, which fits inside the realm of the PlayStation 3. But let's explain it a little bit further. If we're gonna be building a custom PlayStation 5, we're gonna have access to a custom motherboard with fine-tuned power supplies, voltage regulators, and all the other components are gonna be well-tuned by the engineers over at Sony. So I really do think that the 100 watt GPU, the 25 watt CPU, and we'll go ahead and budget you know, 25 watts for other power components. I really think we're gonna hit that 160 watts once the day is done. So we've talked our way through the hardware spec and we've walked our way through the power budgets. Now it's time to put the pedal to the metal and see just how well this PlayStation 5 is gonna actually perform. And to do that, we're gonna be comparing two systems today, our virtual PlayStation 5, against the unclocked and unhindered gaming PC using the exact same components. We're gonna be comparing the average frame rates at a single detail preset, as well as the power consumption for the system as a whole. That way we can kind of compare as apples to apples as we can get between a PC and a console performance. 
We're going to be testing a few different games today, ranging from CPU bottleneck games all the way to GPU bottleneck games. If y'all have got any other games to recommend, let me know down in the comments. But without further ado, let's get to it. So the first game we're going to look at today is going to be Grand Theft Auto V. Now, a lot of people are up in arms because this game's been around forever and we were really hoping for something new like Grand Theft Auto VI. But for us today, it's a really good comparison between a PC performance versus a PlayStation 5. So let's explain some of the graphs we've got here in the chart. So on the left side, we've got our PlayStation 5 at the 3500 megahertz processor speed. And on the right, we have our stock gaming computer with all the limitations unchecked. For the measurements today, we've got in the green bar, the maximum system power usage. And the blue bar will be the average frame rate as reported by the benchmarking tool. For Grand Theft Auto specifically, I am shocked that we are able to maintain the same average frame rate for both the PlayStation 5 as well as the gaming computer. And what's more shocking is the power consumption numbers that we're seeing from the PlayStation 5. At 1080p, we're right at 144 watts. And then at that ever impressive 4K, we're able to run 94 frames per second at only 206 watts, which is well within our thermal and power constraints, and it even matches that 4K 60 frames per second advertised budget. So I gotta say, I am quite impressed by how this game performs. I've always been a fan of Gran Turismo, and Gran Turismo 6 just looks stellar. I, I can't say enough about it. But I don't have it on the PC. The only racing game I have access to is gonna be F1 2017, and it is a really good game from a memory bandwidth perspective. So let's take and see what that kind of looks like. And just as with Grand Theft Auto V, we are able to hit that oh-so-coveted 4K 60 frames per second with our new PlayStation 5 system. Granted, that is the average frame rate, and we did see some minimum and maximums going below and above, but to be honest, with a little bit of tweaking, these game developers are going to be able to deliver an excellent experience when it comes to Gran Turismo. Uh, what's more shocking is, again, the power consumption. We're able to keep our system socket power down to 214 watts, which is well within the PlayStation 3's launch window. All right, so if you're a fan of the Uncharted series, well, I don't have that on the PC, but I do have Shadow of the Tomb Raider. And again, we're going to be echoing ourselves quite a bit. The power consumption on this system is right at 214 watts. And unfortunately, we are not able to get 4K 60 frames per second out of this gaming console, but we're pretty dang close. If we can get an extra 15 frames per second, either through optimizing the graphical settings or implementing features such as like dynamic resolution downscaling, like uh, Doom Eternal or uh, Wolfenstein, I really think we're able to deliver an excellent 4K 60 frames per second experience. But that also begs the question, should this game even be at 4K 60? How about 4K 30 or some other mix between? I really think the PlayStation 5 is well prepared to offer many different resolutions and refresh rates. The hardware is capable of doing it. But what's sad here is the gaming computer is burning uh, over 25% more power and still performing just as good with the average frame rates. So a similar game from a graphics perspective is going to be Red Dead Redemption 2. It's going to be hammering our GPU quite a bit and taking a look at the data. Holy cow. We're actually at 207 watts on our PlayStation 5 and our stock gaming computer goes all the way up to 275 watts, which is incredible. Uh, unfortunately, again, we're not able to hit 4K 60 frames per second, but we are able to hit pretty solid frame rates at both 1080p and 1440p. So again, future games, dynamic resolution scaling, other types of graphical improvements. And I really do think that some of the game developers will be able to, to uh, tweak their stuff and get it the performance to hit the targets. So a game I don't have a lot of experience with, but I've heard is a pretty good representation of a CPU limited game is going to be Hitman 2. It's got a built-in benchmark and it's going to be kind of similar to, you know, Assassin's Creed or other types of slower action games. And taking a look at the average frame rates, you know, we are definitely CPU limited here. The gaming computer is able to outperform average frame rates at 1080p. But, it, you know, classic GPU scaling, we do see the uh, GPU being the weakest link here. And at, f at 4K, we're only getting about 45 average frame per second. 
Again, power consumption clearly in line with what we were expecting, and the gaming computer just continues to chug and burn too much power. So a fan favorite here on the channel is going to be Call of Duty Modern Warfare. We've tested it on our $600 PC. We've also tested it on Shadow. And today we're going to be testing it on our PlayStation 5. And sure enough, our PlayStation 5 is able to keep the power below the 200 watt threshold. But unfortunately, it doesn't hit that 4K 60 frames per second. But again, it's really, really close. And I think we there's some room for optimizations. Uh, the only downside with this game is it is very CPU limited. We saw the utilizations up to about 80%. So this is definitely becoming more of a CPU limited game as opposed to a GPU limited game that we saw with some of our standard gaming components. But if we're comparing directly against the gaming computer, this PlayStation 5 is acting and behaving just like our gaming PC. All right, guys, what do y'all think about that performance? I am quite amazed that in some of the games we were able to actually hit 4K 60 frames per second, and that leads credence to just how good this PlayStation 5 can be with the proper optimizations and the proper software support. So with all the performance in mind, let's talk about price. Um, we know a lot about the gaming computer, so let's get that one out of the way first. So all in on this gaming computer, we are sitting at right around $1,100. Uh, there's a little wiggle room there depending on when you buy your computer or where you buy your computer. But holy cow, for the amount of performance we're getting out of that PlayStation compared to this computer, there, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. But this gaming PC is not ideal for the $1,100. We can do another video about that in the future if you'd like. But let's take what we know uh, about building a console and costs for parts and stuff for the industry. And let's try to make some guesstimations of what it'll cost to build a PlayStation 5. My low end estimate for the cost of a PlayStation 5 is gonna be right at $490. I could even see that going above $600. Because again, the graphics card, we don't know what those are gonna cost. The memory could go, go get really expensive. I, I don't think it's unreasonable to go to 600, 650 bucks. But a lot of the stuff I've read on the internet from market insiders and other developers sees that the, the industry and the market's just not going to buy a $600 console. So to be aggressive, I'm going to say it's going to be $490. You guys can talk, talk to me down in the comments about it, but I really think it could be a $600 console at the end of the day. Well, guys, all this hardware development talk has just got me in a tizzy, man. I am shocked with how well I think the PlayStation 5 is going to perform, and I think we've done the best we can doing our due diligence to make these numbers as accurate as possible. I spent a lot of time thinking about this, guys, so make sure you hit the subscribe button. That way I know you guys like this content. I've got other hardware reviews coming down the pipe, and I love showing you guys tech. You can follow me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash theturk. We actually performed all of this stuff before the YouTube video came out. So if you want to get first glimpse looks at all of my hardware reviews, make sure you're following or even subscribing to me over at Twitch. Again, thank you guys so much for watching the video. I hope you've enjoyed it. You know, I am a PC Master Race guy myself, but I am really looking forward to what the PlayStation 5 and even the Xbox One X or Series X has to show. So appreciate y'all sticking by. Hope y'all have a good night. Take care.